How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Luke chapter 8 verse 1 says, And it came to pass that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And we've just kind of taken the occasion of this verse to deal with the kingdom of God, because the Bible says that Jesus went about, and this is what he's preaching. So the very first message, we talked about the mandate to learn about the kingdom. Jesus preached it, John the Baptist preached it, the disciples preached it, and Paul preached it. Not only that, but after the resurrection of Christ, Christ appeared to the disciples and was still teaching them about the kingdom. So this is a, and this is one of those themes that once you get it in your mind and you understand the kingdom, you'll see it all throughout the New Testament. It'll be a great help and encouragement to you to see God's big picture. And uh, that is the mandate for understanding it. And that's why I've decided to stop and take some time to see the big picture of the kingdom before we continue through the book of Luke. In fact, we're going to deal with the next verse. We're going to deal with the role of women in the kingdom. But then after that, we get right into a parable about the kingdom, right? So it's going to continue after this a little bit, but we're going to take some time to get the big picture. So we saw the mandate to learn about the kingdom. It's all throughout the New Testament. And then we learned about the king of the kingdom. And who is the king of the kingdom? Obviously, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king of the kingdom. And we learned that God's plan for redemption is that he would delegate his authority to Jesus Christ for a time, Christ came to earth, he lived a perfect life, he did miracles showing the power of the kingdom, he died on the cross, paying for our sins, rose again, now he is exalted as Lord over all. You can't miss that in the gospel. That is a key component of the gospel, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. So God has exalted Jesus Christ and says, anyone who would be saved now must bow the knee to my son, Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says in Philippians 2, 9, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things uh, under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the uh, end game of the salvation plan, okay? That Christ is exalted, and that all that would want to desire to bring glory to God would do it by bowing the knee to Christ as king, okay? Uh, So that's the king of the kingdom. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we dealt with the character of the kingdom. When Christ walked the earth, when he healed, remember he healed and he was accused of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he said that a kingdom divided uh, against itself cannot stand. And he said, but if I heal with the power of God, the finger of God, then the kingdom is come to you. When Christ walked the earth, it was as if it was a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. So the king has come, he walked the earth, and if you watched him and you heard his teaching and you saw his miracles, you could get a sense of what the kingdom and its fullness would be like. So Christ came and sickness and disease were eradicated, which is exactly what's going to happen in the future kingdom. When Christ came and he encountered those that had died, death was overcome and he raised them from the dead. And then he himself, upon dying, conquered death. So sickness and disease were eradicated, Death was overcome and demonic powers were conquered. That is, he cast out demons uh, wherever they could be found, but he also spoiled the house of Satan by robbing him of the power of sin and death. So he spoiled demonic powers. And then a foretaste of the kingdom is that righteousness would rule. Uh, That is, Christ came as Lord of truth and righteousness, and that was a foretaste of what would come. Sickness and disease eradicated, death overcome, demonic powers conquered, righteousness ruling. So Christ walked the earth as as if the kingdom had come in a temporary sense, in a foretaste, and he said, this is what's going to come in fruition later. Okay, so the king of the kingdom, the character of the kingdom, the foretaste, but then Christ died, right? So this is what the kingdom is going to be like, and, and he He garnered a following and multitudes followed him. And they said, this is going to be wonderful. He's going to set up his kingdom. Sickness and disease will be gone. Death is overcome. Demons are cast out. Righteousness is going to rule. And then he died. Didn't make any sense. And this led to the confusion of the kingdom. That is, we don't understand what has happened. Here's our king, but now the king's gone. They were confused. 
the two main areas of confusion was the fact that they did not understand that the kingdom for a time would be both spiritual and personal, and it would not be universal and physical until later. Okay, that's one area of confusion. Another was that they did not understand that in order for the kingdom to come, of the Messiah ruling and reigning, they did not understand that Christ would have to die on the cross in order to usher in that kingdom, in order to secure that kingdom. So they did not understand that the death was necessary. So he dies, they're discouraged and they're depressed. Then he comes back after the resurrection. And the first question on their mind is, now will you restore the kingdom again to Israel? They didn't understand. So there's confusion with the kingdom. In fact, Christ gave parables to clear. I'm feeling better now. It's good. Preaching is a cure for everything. Uh, Christ gave parables of the kingdom to explain the mysteries of the kingdom because there was confusion around it. So he gave some parables. Uh, he gave a parable of the sower. Remember that sower went out to sow the seed in the hard soil and the shallow soil and the good soil and so on. The mystery of the kingdom that he was teaching in that parable was the fact that the gospel, the kingdom, will not be universally accepted. That is, you go and you, you cast your net wide and, and you broadcast your seed and you, you preach a free gospel message, but more are going to reject than those that are going to accept. Right? It is not universally accepted, but they, they saw a kingdom that was going to be universal. It was going to, Christ was going to rule and reign over the whole earth. But Christ says, no, here's the mystery. For this time, for now, you will preach, you will cast out your seed, and it will not be universally accepted. It will be rejected by many. Narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. The other mystery of the kingdom, remember he gave the parable of the wheat and the tares growing together, and uh, the dragnet, evil and righteousness, for a time, will dwell together. Evil and righteousness for a time will dwell together. Uh, so you see those who confess Christ at a time, uh, but then ultimately fall by the wayside. You see pastors and preachers who claim to be genuine ministers of Christ, but something happens and they fall and you realize they were counterfeits all along. And uh, Christ says, don't worry about going out and rooting up the tares with the wheat because you might hurt the wheat. The reality of the kingdom is genuine believers and false believers for a time will dwell together. He's going to sort them out then, right? So you get the dragnet and you get all kinds of junk in the dragnet. And there's some good fish in there and things, but everything else gets cast out. That's the nature of the kingdom. Evil and righteousness dwelling together. And then the lastly, the confusion of the kingdom. The kingdom for now is not universally accepted. Uh, righteousness and evil dwell side by side. And the kingdom will start out small but eventually will be a worldwide and mighty force. That's the parable of the mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds, but eventually it grows into a, a tree big enough that the birds can sit in its branches. This is true, and we see that, we experience that at Calvary Baptist Church, just in a small version of the kingdom here in the, the body, as we see a slow growth, right? It is a slow growth, and sometimes it can be discouraging. But Christ says, this is the nature of the kingdom. But the day is going to come where the kingdom is universal and is worldwide. Okay, but it starts out slow. Now, the king of the kingdom, the character of the kingdom, the confusion of the kingdom, and today we're going to look at the citizens of the kingdom. The citizens of the kingdom. What are they like? You got a king over a kingdom, and what is a kingdom? Well, a kingdom, it's made up of people. It's made up of servants of the king, those who have pledged their allegiance to the king. And in a nutshell, that's what we're talking about here. These are those who have bowed the knee to the king and said, I am submitting myself to your rulership. That is, uh, you are the king uh, and I desire to be your servant. Now, this is the wonderful thing about being a citizen or a, a, a citizen of the kingdom of God. Even though Christ's kingdom is future, as far as his thousand year physical millennial reign and even though that eternal kingdom of heaven is future all those who bow the knee to christ now as their king they become beneficiaries of a foretaste of the blessings of the kingdom that as you get to experience the love and the joy and the peace and the comfort you get to experience all the blessings of heaven in your life now as a foretaste of what is to come so citizens of the kingdom who bow the knee to Christ now, they experience the blessings of the kingdom now. And I hope that that's been your experience as a Christian. So we got to say this about the kingdom as well. We kind of already alluded to it in Luke 13, 23. 
Then said one unto him, Lord, this is in response to the kingdom parables that he's giving. Uh, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at that straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So Christ gives these parables. And you might be thinking this as I'm teaching. You think, wait a second. The sower and the seed. A lot of seed goes out. Some spring up. Some die. Some are choked out. Uh, and there's only, in that parable, there's only a fourth of those who receive the gospel uh, who were genuine believers say, uh, you're making this too hard. There's, are you trying to say that there's, there's not a whole lot of people that can or will be saved? This is exactly what the disciples asked Christ. Wait a second, Jesus. Are you telling me this kingdom is not going to be worldwide and everybody's not going to come to you and bow their knees? He says, no. He says, narrow is the way. He says, strive to enter into the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Yeah, few there be that saved, that are saved. So the citizens, they are few relatively speaking. So, what do these citizens look like? Well, first of all, citizens of the kingdom are repentant. Citizens of the kingdom are repentant. Now, these are things we are going to gather from the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are going to gather these from things he has said of the kingdom. We're going to look at these things he said of the kingdom, and we're going to draw a profile of a citizen of the kingdom, okay? And first of all, uh, citizens of the kingdom are repentant. Matthew 21, 28. Jesus says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Really? The picture is this. A man needs some workers. He goes to one and says, hey, go into the field and work. No, I don't want to. After some time, he thought about it, and he decided, you know what, I really should go. And he went, and he worked. The other one says, okay, I'm going. And he didn't go. Well, which one did the will of the Father? Well, obviously, the one who, after a time, repented or changed his mind and went and did it. What Christ is doing is he's making a comparison. He says, on one hand, you have the Jewish people who are the heirs of the kingdom. You expect them to do the will of the Father. You expect them to be into the kingdom. And then over here, you have a sinful Gentile nation. You have those who are not the chosen people of God, okay? They're living sinful lives, maybe even worshiping pagan gods. Here they are. Jesus said, I have come to the Jews. They have been told to receive me. Uh, they claim they have a show of faith, uh, but it's not a genuine faith. Uh, so they have not received Christ. Though from all appearances, and they'll tell you that they are believers, but they're not. And then over here you have these Gentile people, the, the thieves and the drunkards and the adulterers, who after a time repented of their sin and put their faith in Christ. Which one has done the will of the Father? Those who have repented, right? Those who have repented. That's the picture. The Jews had God's covenants. They had the scriptures. They had uh, their his prophets. They were God's chosen people. But many of those ethnic Jews would never become genuine spiritual Jews. Uh, but those Gentiles who would repent, they would become the immediate citizens of the kingdom. We saw it when we learned about the centurion. Remember the centurion's servant? When he expressed that great faith in Jesus Christ, and Christ turned from this Gentile Roman centurion and looked to the Jewish elders and said, I have not seen so great faith, no, not in Israel. He says, here's a Gentile. And he says, I have not seen great faith even in Israel like this. Well, in the account of Matthew chapter 8, the same account, parallel, after the centurion's servant, he says, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. In Matthew eight eleven, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's saying to the Jews, you are the children of the kingdom. You are the heirs apparent. But the day is going to come when the kingdom comes that you will be cast out of the kingdom. You're not going to be allowed to come in. 
But you know who will come in? Those coming from the east and the west, from all these other nations, these Gentile nations, they will come in and they will sit down and they will sit and eat with Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, and you're going to be on the, on the outside looking in. Why? Because it's not the self-righteous. It's never the self-righteous. It is the repentant, okay? It is the publicans. It is the harlots. It is the sinners, those who have come to Christ and have repented of their sin, placed their faith in him. They are the citizens of the kingdom. This is a tremendous and amazing truth, isn't it? You get into church and you think this, uh, you think self-righteousness, you think hypocrisy, you think of arrogance, you think about things like this. Listen, if you understand the Bible, it's nothing of the sort. Those who are citizens of the kingdom are simply sinners who have recognized their need of salvation and have repented and received Christ, right? Uh, Christ says to the Jews, you think because of your ethnicity? You think because of your background? You're getting get into the kingdom? Absolutely not. So God is holy, and he is righteous, and he is perfect. He is entirely separate from sin. In him dwells no darkness at all. Okay, this is who God is. Yet it brings him great joy to do what? To take the lowly, the wicked, the rebellious of this world, and to transform them into genuine worshipers of God. That's what the kingdom's made out of. It's never the self-righteous religious class. It's the repentant sinner that enters in, the thief, the adulterer, the drunkard, those that God transformed into repentant, worshipful, uh, worshipful citizens of the kingdom of God. Isn't that a comfort to you? You know, it's not about your performance, and it was never about your performance. You know, it's not about your goodness. It never was about your goodness. Uh, it's all about his grace, and that's why he's designed salvation this way. We're going to see that in a moment. So, the repentant sinner, the thief, the adulterer, the drunk, you name it, it's these who have turned from their sin and received Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, wait a second. Isn't that the opposite of what we just said? We'll keep reading. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And that's bad news for some people, isn't it? But then verse 11. And such were... Some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. He's saying none of these can enter into the kingdom. But then, and this is a tremendous verse, he says, but you were like this, weren't you? You were like this. This is your old lifestyle. So this is who the kingdom is. The Corinthian church were made up of a bunch of people. He says, some of you were thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers, uh, effeminate, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers. This is who you were, church. Man, we need to get rid of this idea that the, only the good come to church. This is a place for the self-righteous, the arrogant, the judgmental. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, this is a place for the worst of the worst sinners who have come to the place and said, I know I need to be saved, and they have bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. This is what the church is made out of. That's Christian. That, that, you need to get that down as your Christian identity, don't you? This is our Christian identity. This is who we are. Absolutely nothing, absolutely unworthy, but made worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the kingdom is made out of. And it's entirely, this is entirely an act of God. Entirely an act of God that can take these wicked, unworthy, unable sinners and turn them into worshipers of God. Entirely an act of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It says, Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. This is what you used to be. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This is who we were. But God, it's an act of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Now compare that to the previous passage. Think about this. While the fornicator was fornicating, while the thief was stealing, while the adulterer was committing adultery. Go on and on and on. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. God sovereignly 
has gone and taken these sinners in the midst of their sin, and he has done a work in their heart by the Holy Spirit of God, has drawn them to himself, and he has made worshipful citizens of the kingdom out of them. This is what the kingdom is made out of. Citizens of the kingdom. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So this is what we used to be, malice and envy and hateful and diverse lust, disobedience deceived, and so on. But then the kindness of God appeared. And then he did what? He made us heirs. Heirs of what? Heirs of the kingdom. You know the evidence that God does this work in us, that God has done this work in the heart of a sinner? The evidence is repentance. Because they say, oh, repentance, uh, you make the gospel too hard by telling people they got to repent. No, because it's an act of God. God's the one who does it. God's the one who brings somebody to repentance. It's not hard to say that somebody must repent because it's entirely an act of God. It can only be an act of God because we are spiritually dead. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, when the gospel was opened up to the Gentiles, they looked and they saw the Gentiles receiving the Holy Ghost, and then they said, well, then surely then God also to the Gentiles has granted repentance to life. God grants repentance as a gift, right? It is by his grace. You say, I was smart enough to repent. <laughs> Feel bad for all those people out there who weren't smart enough to repent of their sin. Uh, there's no room. There's nowhere in the gospel where self-righteousness can uh, worm its way in. There's, there's no aspect of the gospel that lends itself to self-righteousness. Get that down. Every aspect of the gospel simply magnifies the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it glorifies the grace of God. Uh, every aspect of the gospel points to the grace of God and never to self-righteousness. Why does God operate this way? Why does he uh, go and make up the kingdom, sends the invitation out uh, to to folks to come to the dinner and and they reject it and say, we're not going. And they say, tells the servants, okay, go out into the streets and and get the the little street urchins, get them to come in, okay? Get the homeless, uh, get the sinners, have them come into dinner. Why does he make the kingdom out of these people? Why would he operate that way? Well, number one, Because repentant sinners make the best worshipers. Repentant sinners make the best worshipers. In Luke chapter 7, we saw the woman who came in when Jesus was at dinner with the Pharisee. And she came in and began to wipe his feet with her tears. Wash his feet with his tears. Wipe them with her hair. And she worshiped. She sacrificed. She humiliated herself. She put her pride and her glory at the feet of Christ. She worshiped in the presence of a Pharisee who would not worship. In fact, he sat judging her more than he did adoring Christ. The whole point of that situation was to point out that those who are forgiven much love much. Those who are forgiven much worship much. God has made up the kingdom of God this way because he's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And those who will worship him in this way are those who have a deep sense of their own sinfulness and inability. They're the ones who have a deep sense and understanding of the vastness of the forgiveness that God has given them. So this is who we are. Understand, uh, we don't need uh, a greater sense of self-esteem in the church. What we need is a biblical understanding of Christian identity. And that is that we are simply repentant sinners who are granted that repentance by the grace of God. Repentant sinners make the best worshipers. Repentant uh, sinners bring God the most glory. They bring God the most glory. Somebody who says, hey, I grew up in a Christian home. I've understood the gospel my whole life. Uh, I have never gone into sin. I've never done any of this stuff. And uh, I just uh, uh, just kind of just ease into the kingdom. That may be, and that's wonderful. Anybody who enters into the kingdom, that's wonderful. But there are those who are self-righteous and think they're just heirs of the kingdom, right? I just deserve it. Does that bring God glory? Absolutely not. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 
And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things, uh, to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So what do we have here? We have God choosing the citizens of the kingdom. We have God choosing the citizens of the kingdom. And who does he choose? He chooses the weak. He chooses the ignoble. Uh, he chooses the foolish. This is who he chooses for the kingdom. Why? There's a purpose in his choice. The purpose in his choice is in verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So the kingdom is made up out of those repentant sinners, granted repentance by God, who have realized their inability and their unworthiness, have repented, bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, and now what can you do but give glory to God? I cannot give any glory to myself. It wasn't my own intelligence that led me to this place. It wasn't my own righteousness that led me into the kingdom, but it was all the grace of God. So, citizens of the kingdom are repentant sinners. Not only that, but you can see from this passage you just saw, the citizens of the kingdom are chosen by God. He's the one that has designed it this way. So, a person says, well, I have not attended church my whole life. I've not always been a believer. Perhaps I've even lived a debased life before my salvation. But the day came when I heard the gospel, recognized my need for salvation, my inability to earn it, and I repented. I turned to God from all my life of sin. I, in addition, I knew that it was entirely a work of God. He came to me in the midst of my sin and is entirely responsible for my conversion. This is Christian identity. It was a merciful act of love on his part toward one who is estranged from him. This is what the city... Is that not comforting to you? I hope that's comforting to you. It ought to be comforting. It ought to be exciting. All at the same time. This is what the, you can never think, oh, I just don't fit into the kingdom. <laughs> Right? I just don't fit in. Everybody fits in. What God has done is he's taken all those who feel as if they don't fit in. And he said, hey, I want you and you're going to be part of the kingdom. And all those who felt like they were going to inherit the kingdom, those self-righteous Jews, he says, you're going to be on the outside looking in. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, how does that fly in the face of the stereotypical uh, idea of what church is? Uh, I love it when the Bible destroys our preconceptions. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. It says humility, right? Childlike humility. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not self-righteousness, it's humility, it's repentance. So God's glorious kingdom is populated by those who are once sinners, outcast, the lonely, lowly, the downtrodden, the unworthy, they are citizens simply because they understood their inability, their unworthiness. They repented and received Christ by faith. Paul said his repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. That's what brings about salvation. And then from the other side, once we are saved, we look and we recognize, oh, the only reason I repented is because God granted me that repentance to God be the glory and all the glory. Citizens of the kingdom are repentant sinners. Citizens of the kingdom are chosen by God. And citizens of the kingdom have given up all for the kingdom. Now remember what we're doing is we're gleaning truths from Christ's own teachings about the kingdom. Citizens of the kingdom have given up all for the kingdom. Matthew 13, 44. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, that which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the kingdom of God. Citizen, a citizen of the kingdom loves the kingdom. He values the kingdom. In fact, the kingdom and the king are the most precious and valuable thing in this man's life uh, to the point where he's willing to go and to sell abs uh, everything that he has in order to obtain it. This is a citizen of the kingdom. The ability, I believe, to recognize the value of the kingdom, again, I believe, is granted by God. We see a negative example in contrast. We deal with this young man a lot in Luke chapter 18, because very instructive, verse 22. 
But I, I don't want to focus on him as much as I, I want to focus on the disciples' response to him, as we're going to see. Luke eighteen twenty two. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, this is the rich young ruler talking about how from his youth he kept the commandments and things like that. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? Again, Christ is painting this picture of a very narrow road. And the disciples are perplexed. They thought this kingdom was going to be a wide, universal kingdom. And Christ keeps painting this picture of this narrow road. And they say, who? Who can be saved then? And listen to verse 27. And he said, the things which are impossible, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. He says, you're right. There are few. It is hard, but that's okay because God is the one who works it all out. God is the one who is sovereign in all of this. Uh, yes, with man, it is impossible. But with God, but with God, it is possible. As it's, it's a work of God. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto him, unto them, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. So Peter says, we've left all and followed you. Christ didn't say, well, that was foolish, Peter. <laughs> you should have kept some of your stuff. I mean, you, you got to have some security. Uh, that's not what he said. He validated Peter and this absolute abandon and surrender to Christ, he validated it and said, yes, Peter. And there's nobody who has not left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more. What is, what is that? You're going to get, receive the kingdom blessings here and you're going to inherit the kingdom there. Kingdom, citizen of the kingdom is one who has given up all for the kingdom. Why? Because you see the value of the kingdom. You find, you go in the, in the field and you find a treasure. And you say, you know what? I want that treasure. I want it so valuable. I want it so much. I'm going to go sell all that I have to buy the entire field so I can have that treasure. The pearl, a great price. You go and you find the pearl. You value it so much. You sell all that you have so you can have that pearl. The kingdom of God. You see it. You value it. You want it. So what? You're willing to give up all for the kingdom. Like Peter, a citizen of the kingdom is one who's given up everything for the kingdom. It is his predominant Predominant, supreme, sovereign care in his life. A love for the king and a longing for the kingdom. That is what governs your life. The rich young ruler is one who saw the price of the kingdom. He says, here's the price of the kingdom. Here's all my stuff. And in his estimation, the value of his stuff was greater than the value of the kingdom. What Jesus is saying is that a citizen of the kingdom recognizes there is nothing that compares to the value of the kingdom. In Luke 14, 25, Christ is a wonderful account. Christ is walking. Great multitudes are following him. They're there for all sorts of reasons, different motivations. Okay, they're following Christ in Luke 14. And he turned and said unto them, picture it, Christ walking, multitudes behind him. They're all there for all sorts of different reasons. He turns to address the crowd and says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consult us whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. It's this idea that the kingdom has to be the predominant value in your life. That is, you desire it so much. That is, you love the king, and in loving the king, you value the kingdom so much that you're willing to give up everything 
Really? Yeah, listen, folks, there's no way to avoid the teachings of Jesus Christ when it comes to the kingdom. And what he says is that you must forsake all for him. That means we go and sell our house. Not necessarily. But if you want you to, you better be willing to. Does that mean you give up your relationships? Uh, not necessarily. But if he wants you to, you better be willing to. You got to be willing to say, Christ and his kingdom are of more value to me than my relationships. Christ and his kingdom are of more value to me than my possessions. Right? This is what we're saying. Christ and his kingdom are of tremendous value. So the man who found treasure in the field and the man who found the pearl of great price both sold all that they had in order to purchase those treasures. And here Christ says, Likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. This is a citizen of the kingdom. I want the kingdom. I want the king. And because I want these things, uh, because I value them so greatly, nothing in this world is of greater value to me than the kingdom of God. That's a citizen of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ is to be the object of absolute and supreme value in our lives. So much so that everything, possessions, pursuits, relationships, even our own life, eh, it pales in comparison to the kingdom of God. This is exactly what Paul told us in Philippians 3, 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency. He's saying, it literally means the surpassing worth. It says, I count all things but loss for the surpassing worth. I value, I see the worthiness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He says, everything I have lost is nothing. Everything I have is nothing. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of the, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's the attitude of a citizen of the kingdom. So, Citizens of the kingdom of God are sinners chosen by God and granted repentance. They have a deep sense of their own sinfulness, their inability to save themselves, and the tremendous value of the kingdom. So much so that Christ has become the object of greatest value in their lives. They have a willingness to give up all for him. Unlike the seed in the hard soil, Satan does not snatch that seed away. Unlike the seed in the shallow soil, the sun doesn't scorch it and kill it. Unlike the seed in the weedy soil, the cares of the world are unable to choke out that faith. Why? Because the kingdom is everything to me. Citizens of the kingdom are repentant sinners. Citizens of the kingdom are chosen by God. Citizens of the kingdom have given up all for the kingdom. And closely related to that one is that citizens of the kingdom are fully committed to Jesus Christ. They're fully committed to Jesus Christ. Listen, a king is not a president. A king is not a prime minister. A king is an absolute sovereign. A king is an absolute sovereign. And those in the kingdom are under the rulership of the king and say, I pledge my allegiance and I bow my knee to the king. Luke chapter 9, verse 57, again, Christ speaking of the kingdom. It says, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. He said, you can follow me, but there's going to be a cost. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He says, when you love the kingdom of God and you have committed yourself to Christ, there is no looking back. There is no looking back. A citizen of the kingdom has no regrets where his faith is concerned. I don't regret receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't regret bowing my knee to him as king. I don't look back to the world longingly with regret saying, I wish I could go back. He says, no, you have started the work. You've started the plowing. You don't look back now. That's a citizen of the kingdom. He has wholly forsaken his old life. He has wholly forsaken 
the world. He in no way desires to go back to what he had before. In fact, when he looks at that, now we're all tempted at times. Okay, we're all tempted at times to go back. And, and we all at times uh, fall into sin and meddle with that kind of stuff, don't we? But the Holy Spirit convicts us and we repent of it. And we say, you know what? Uh, that pales in comparison to the value of the kingdom. And that's what keeps bringing us back to the kingdom of God. It's interesting. I don't usually use little anecdotes and illustrations in my sermons, but I thought this was very interesting. There's a hymn that we have not sung in, in quite a long time, but we have sung said, called I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And it's interesting. What, the reason I, I wanted to mention this, I thought it was very interesting. Do you know that that hymn is of uh, originated in India? You realize this? It originated in India? Uh, absolutely did. In the middle of the 19th century, there is a man in a northeastern, uh, uh, northeastern Indian village. He was a Christian. And in, the, in that area, Sikhism was very, uh, was very popular. And, and this man had converted to Christianity. And uh, those uh, people in the village had come upon him and they wanted him to renounce his faith. They wanted him to renounce his faith. In fact, they threatened to kill him because he had become a Christian. Now, this is happening in India. And as the account goes, as he is told to renounce his Christian faith by the village chief, he declared, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. In response then, they decided that they would threaten his family. So they threatened his wife. And as the report goes, as he looked and they're threatening his wife, he said, though no one joins me, still I will follow. His wife then was executed. And as the account goes, the wife then, before execution, said, the cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. Now, all of this was written down by an Indian missionary. An Indian missionary, I won't tell you his name because I can't pronounce it, but <laughs> it was an Indian missionary who wrote all this down after witnessing and hearing of the execution of this Christian man. And then in 1959, it was taken by a, a Western uh, man who wrote this down, and it's in this popular form today in our hymn book. But that hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, the world behind me, the cross before me. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Listen, that's what we're talking about. Uh, here's this, and I, I'm wonderful, I think it's wonderful to hear that, because that's not just some guy sitting at a desk who decided to write these words down. Those were the words expressed by a man who had genuinely decided in his heart, I have chosen Christ and there is no going back. There is no going back. That's the idea of being crucified with Christ, right? Once you're dead, crucified with Christ, there's no coming back, right? That's one thing a crucified man, unless you're Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, you're not going to say, okay, change my mind. If you're crucified with Christ, you are dead to self and alive unto God. Again, this is exactly what Paul says in Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reach, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, it's all forward for me. There is no going back. That is the nature of the kingdom of God. You put your hand to the plow and you never turn back. Citizen of the kingdom, repentant sinners, chosen by God, have given up all for the kingdom, are fully committed to Christ, and we will end with this one. Citizens of the kingdom are not comfortable in this world. Why? Because we're citizens of a different kingdom. We're not citizens here. We are citizens of that kingdom, which means we cannot be citizens of this kingdom. Some Christians want to have dual citizenship. It doesn't work, okay? We are not at home here. We're not settled in. Uh, we're not in this world to see what we can get out of it. We're just passing through. We are pilgrims. We are citizens of a different kingdom, a kingdom that we are eagerly awaiting for and experiencing the blessings of now, Hebrews 13, verse 12, says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore, forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. It says he was taken outside the city, and that's where he was crucified. Let's go out with him, and let's bear the same reproach he did. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. He says, it is okay to be the cast off in this society. It's okay to be the one that's rejected by this world. Why? Because this is not our city, but we look for one that is coming. 
That is the nature of a citizen of the kingdom. Always the outsider and never at home. Listen, if you have a complex or you need to be accepted by people, you're not going to be a very good citizen of the kingdom. You need to be willing to say, it's okay if they don't love me. It's okay if they hate me because I don't belong here. I am a citizen of a kingdom that is yet to come. We have a different love and we have a different life and we have different goals and different affections and a different king. We say, this isn't mine. If you feel at home here, you need to question where your citizenship belongs. John 17, verse 14, Jesus praying to the Father. I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Our king is not of the world and certainly those in his kingdom also should not be part of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's the nature of a citizen of the kingdom. Now, we must understand the world is not our home, but we long for a kingdom that is to come. In fact, that is a mark of genuine faith. That is a mark of genuine faith. The person who says, there is a kingdom coming. That's my eternal perspective. This is what governs my life. The fact that there is a kingdom coming. And I say that as a mark of great faith because that's what you see in Hebrews 11. It falls right in line with our memory verse. Hebrews 11, verse 13. After this list of these men and women who have exercised great faith and the evidence of their faith, it doesn't just say they had faith, but it shows you the evidence of their faith because faith uh, always overflows into action. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And we're persuaded of them and embrace them. How can you be persuaded of something and embrace something that's yet future by faith? And confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. He says, they went through life with their eyes on the heavenly kingdom. If they were mindful of that country that they had came from, that is, if their affections were still in that country they had come from, then it is possible that they would have returned. And that's why it's absolutely crucial for you and I as a Christian to cut off our affections from this world. Because when you still have a tie to this world with your affections or your lusts, then you have an occasion to return. But he says they didn't even consider it. Their affections were cut off. Therefore, they did not desire to return, but they looked forward to the kingdom of God. Wherefore, God was not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because they knew they weren't at home in this world. Because they knew their affections rested in a kingdom that was coming. And for this reason, the Bible says God was not ashamed to be called their God. They knew that they had an eternal heavenly home. So they had an eternal heavenly perspective toward this world and it greatly pleased God. Christ gives us a, we're talking about being ashamed before God or God being ashamed of us. Christ kind of addressed this in Luke chapter 9. We're almost done here, folks. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. He's saying, what advantage is it to you if you gain this entire world? You say, I love this world. I have affections for this world. He says, there is no advantage. So you gain this world, but you lose your own soul. What he's saying is you need to die to this world. Realize this is not your kingdom. You are not a citizen here. And then when that happens, guess what? You gain your soul. <laughs> you lose the world. You gain your soul. This is what it comes down to. Do we live in this life to gain this world? Or do we live in this life looking forward to gaining the kingdom? One characteristic of a citizen of the kingdom is that his lifestyle reflects the fact that he's not at home in this world. He is eagerly awaiting the kingdom of God, which puts him at odds with the world. It can be seen in his approach to life and his approach to his possessions and his pursuits, his goals, his lifestyle simply screams, I don't belong here. Don't get settled down and content in this place. Have your affections uh, filled up with the things of this world. No, we're citizens of a different kingdom, aren't we? So 
review, we're done. Citizens of the kingdom are repentant sinners. Citizens of the kingdom are chosen by God and granted this repentance. Citizens of the kingdom have given up all for the kingdom of God. Citizens of the kingdom are fully committed to Jesus Christ, and citizens of the kingdom are not comfortable in this world. The last point that we don't have time for, we'll deal with next week, is that citizens of the kingdom are eagerly awaiting the coming of their king. Let's go ahead and pray. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure 